Hi you guys, welcome back to another video. My name is Shamira, if you are new to my channel. Um, if you are not new to my channel, welcome back. And this video, I'm just going to be doing a regular day in the life. I don't know if I want it to be another realistic video because um, the last one I did that was like an hour long, that video has the most views out of all my coding videos. So I don't know if you guys like when I have long videos or if YouTube is like really pushing that video um, out to people, but we can try and do another realistic day today. I actually already started about two and a half hours ago. So my day will be over So I don't have like a full on eight hour day that I'm going to have footage of, but you know, with editing and breaking everything down, you can kind of squeeze in five hours and cut it down to one hour. So it really doesn't matter. Um, but what I already went through so far today was my denials. I went and made corrections to some claims that needed LMPs on them. And then I had to go in the office. Work queue is what we call like where charges drop if they're holding um, to be reviewed. I had to go into the offices or well, my office's work queue to get some stuff out of there because sometimes if they have charges holding in their work queue, it prevents my charges from going out. So I had to go in there and um, correct some things. Like sometimes they will have the weeks of gestation as the first primary diagnosis code, and that cannot be a primary diagnosis, the Z3A, and then however many weeks the patient is, it can't be first. And sometimes they choose that, and that's the only diagnosis code they choose. And then I'll have to go in and review what they um, had in the note to see is this her first pregnancy? Is it her second or third pregnancy? Um, is there any O codes that I can use? Like, is she diabetic? Um, does she have anemia? Or should I just use the one that's just a normal pregnancy, the Z34 diagnosis code, like the Z3403, if this was her third trimester and it was a normal pregnancy, or if this was, um, a what is it called uh let me look z 34 is this an other pregnancy uh, other normal pregnancy which is the z 34 8 and then whatever trimester she is one two or three so yeah that's what i did so far and now i'm in my work queue and i'm getting ready to um start coding so how i prioritize my work queue for today is I have a bunch of office stuff in here and then I have some outpatient surgeries and then of course the bulk of my work is going to be delivery so inpatient um, codes which normally we don't build inpatient services because that's usually included in the delivery but sometimes we do see patients that come into the ED and then we're billing like an ED visit or a consult visit. Um, what else? Or if the patient is in triage or labor hall, we bill for those even, those, even though those aren't inpatient, we still bill those out because those are not included in um, the global package or the, 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 or the delivery, can't talk. Um, but right now I have an uh, endometrial biopsy. So that's CPT code 58100. And then my provider is also billing for an office visit. And usually if the patient's coming in for a procedure, we don't bill an E&M, but um, this is going to be a pre-op office visit for, it looks like a hysteroscopy the patient is going to get scheduled for so we are going to bill an e m for that she had put modifier 57 on her e m but the only 
way you would need modifier 57 is if the procedure or surgery you were billing um, has a 90 day global and endometrial biopsies is only a zero or a 10 day. I can actually look it up and tell you guys. Okay, so 58100 has a zero day global period. So I'm just going to put modifier 25 on the ENM since it is another procedure billed on the same day. And I'm reviewing her documentation. And now I'm going to check pathology to see what was on that sample. I did not get anything. So. I'm going to go ahead and bill this out. Oh, wait, hang on. Because she's billing these on two different days. Okay, so when did she put her time in? The 19th. Okay, so it looks like what happened when I tried to bill out that procedure in ENM, I had got an error that modifier 25 is only needed when a procedure is billed on the same day. And um, the reason why that came up is because she's billing the biopsy for the 22nd, but the ENM was billed on the 19th. And I looked at her notes and it looks like the patient came in on the 19th, but she documented the biopsy on the 22nd. So I'll need her to fix this. Yeah, it says encounter date at the top, the 19th. So the patient came in on the 19th, not the 22nd. And I'll have to send her a message to correct the date in her note. And I'm so happy because she's in, um, she's at the hospital today. So she should get back to me soon. Okay, next up, I have an NST that I am reviewing. And the patient came in because she had decreased fetal movement, so she wasn't feeling the baby move. And um, this was a non-reactive NST. So I'm gonna show you guys the diagnosis codes that I'm going to report for this NST. And I can also show you guys the CPT code for that. Um, okay. So my CPT code and my diagnosis codes. Um, the weeks of gestation, I'm really not going to show my, on my book because all it is is Z3A point and then however many weeks the patient is and this patient was 37 weeks. So let me show you guys the decreased fetal movement diagnosis and then the abnormalities of the fetal heart, which is the non-reactive NST. Here is the CPT code for fetal non-stress test, which is what NST stands for. 
And then my diagnosis codes, remember I had decreased fetal movement, which is the O3681. She's in her third trimester, so I had to put the three. And then that little seventh indicator right there, the little red box, that means I need to put another digit after the three. And it's going to be a zero because this is a single gestation, gestation pregnancy. And then for the non-reactive NST, I'm going to go down to 036.833 for third trimester. And then again, zero because this is only one baby. But if it were twins, we would use the number one for baby A and number two for baby B. If it were triplets, we would use three for baby C and so forth. So whenever it's just one fetus, we always use zero. And that's all I'll have on the claim, apart from the weeks of gestation. Okay, so I'm moving on to my next NST. And I see that the patient was at the hospital a couple times in labor hall, probably due to some of the complications she has. She has insulin controlled uh, gestational diabetes, chronic hypertension, and obesity. So I have to make sure we don't have, you know, missed revenue and make sure something was billed for both of these dates. Wait. Yes, we built something. Okay, so that's taken care of. For my NST that we have here, I am going to review it and everything looks good. So for my diagnosis codes, I'm just gonna go back a couple pages for gestational diabetes. Literally all my diagnosis codes are already listed, um, but I'll show you guys. Uh, where is it? Oh, 24, what is it? Two, oh no, four, 414, which is A2GDM. Um, that's the abbreviation for insulin controlled gestational diabetes. And then let me show you guys. Okay, so my first diagnosis, I have O24414. My next one I have for chronic hypertension over here. And we are using 913 because this is her third trimester. And I'm using unspecified because they do not specify the type of um, hypertension. This is just regular chronic hypertension unspecified. And then for the obesity, I'm going to go to my O99 and then look for 213 obesity complicating pregnancy, third trimester. And then I'm going to have the E6601 diagnosis code. With that and my weeks of gestation. Again, the NST code is the 59025. Next, I just reviewed two colposcopies with biopsies and ECCs, and that CBT code is 57454. You see I have circled BX, well, I have circled and, but abbreviated below, I have BX and ECC. These are some of the abbreviations that you'll see on your note or the provider will have in the note. So I like to have those abbreviations in my book as well. And the diagnosis code that we used for the first one was right here under the R87.61. And the indication was for LGSIL, low grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. And the patient also was positive for HPV, which is on the next page. And it was high risk for the cervix. So R87.810. I reviewed pathology and they did not have anything on there. 
um, definitive for diagnosis. So we're gonna go with what the provider had, which was those two codes. And then the second one was the same CPT code, the 57454. And the diagnosis code that they used on the second one was R87611. So the atypical squamous cells that cannot exclude high grade, the ASCH. Now, when I went to pathology, pathology had SIN1 um, that they detected or, yeah, detected from the sample. So that is going to be the N87-0. You guys can see that right here. And it is an excludes one. So when you have excludes one, you cannot use N87-0 and R87 or any of these codes. Um, you cannot use them together. It is an excludes one and you always go with pathology. So N87-0 is what we are going to put on the claim and get rid of the diagnosis code that the provider had reported. So I just finished reviewing an NST and I found a triage note or labor hall visit that was not billed for. So I had to bill for that. And when the patient is seen in labor hall, we bill outpatient ENMs. And this is the audit tool, the new one for 2021. Um, they did labs and an NST and everything came back negative. So my diagnosis code that I used was the 04703 because she was 36 weeks. And then she also has obesity. So that would be a stable chronic illness. And the one that I have circled at the top for minor problem was the fact that the water or the patient thought her water broke. So that would be the self-limited or minor problem. And, or you can say it was acute, but to me, it's not acute. What else? Oh, the second column here, I circled for labs ordered and reviewed. And in order to give credit for independent interpretation of the test, if she interpreted the NST, it would have to have been um, performed by another physician and she did it. So I can't give credit there. And this is going to be a 99213. Hubby is here today because it is Black Friday and he did not have to go into work today. So it's him and I, my daughter is with my mom she went with her and then my son went with my mother-in-law so it's just us two here and he got us Duncan and that's so nice so I don't have to get up and make breakfast I just did a few IUD procedures. So I had some insertions, removals, as well as some Nexplanon and Paragard removals and insertions and um, some removals by themselves. So for the first few procedures, you see that IUD insertions are right here, 58300, and then for the removal is 58301. I also keep the diagnosis codes <clears throat> for those procedures written on the side there as a reminder. Also, I have my Mirena Hixpix code, J7298, written right here <clears throat> as a reminder to use that one whenever the patient does have Mirena. There are other ones like Kylina. Um, I have a sticky note that's on my desktop. And what are some other ones? Copper, so the Paragard. That is also a Hixpix code. Um, for Nexplanon removals, you will have to go near the front of your book. And I have a tab for Nexplanon. 
<clears throat> oh my goodness, I don't know why my throat is so dry. Um, this is for the next one on insertion. And then up here is where you would have the removal by itself. And then if the patient has a removal and then reinsertion of a new one, that is the 11983. When it comes to diagnosis codes for those procedures, I report Z3046. You see that's written right there um, for Nexplanon removals and insertions when they're all on the same um, at the same time. If it's a removal by itself, then I use the Z3046. And then if it's an insertion, I use the Z3017. If it's just an insertion only and it's not a reinsertion. And then for IUDs, those insertions are right here. And that is the Z3430 for insertion and then Z3432 for removal. And then right here is where it'll tell you for um, reinsertion or removal of an implantable subdermal contraceptive. So those are the diagnosis codes that I use for those type of procedures. Now I'm moving on to um, some outpatient surgeries and I'm starting off with some hysteroscopy procedures. So that is going to be over here. You see it says laparoscopy and hysteroscopies. And then you will just go all the way over here to where you are just at um, hysteroscopies because this page here, always pay attention to the beginning of the um, code description. So laparoscopies are all throughout here and then hysteroscopies start here. So I'm going to come over here because we did a hysteroscopy with Milesher, which is the 58558. And then my next um, surgery I did on a different patient was a hysteroscopy with endometrial ablation and we use the Navashore. So these are some of the types of endometrial ablations that you might see in your op note. So you know which one is which. So this one is the one that I build and the diagnosis code that I had used on that first hysteroscopy in Myosure was the um, endometrial polyp N84.0. And then the hysteroscopy I did for endometrial ablation was actually right here, N92.0 for um, excessive and frequent menstruation with regular cycle. I just reviewed a colonization of the cervix with a loop electrode. So that is a LEAP procedure. And I have a note that 57505 is included in the 57522 because the 57505 is the ECC, the endocervical curatage. You cannot bill that separate, it is included. And that is why I have that note there. Um, you might also see in the op note, Fisher tip, or I think sometimes it'll say like a yellow Fisher tip. I look up stuff like that in the op note so that way I know what they're using and can remember what CPT code that is. So like whenever I see Fisher tip, I already know what that looks like because I Googled it. Um, and the diagnosis code that we reported was the one for SIN2, I believe it was N87-1. If not, then it might've been SIN1, which was N87-0. I can't remember. Um, but I had to hold it because I don't have pathology yet for it. So 57522, two, I had to hold in my work queue. Once pathology comes in, then I'll know if I'm keeping this diagnosis code that they chose or if I'll be changing it. Okay, so remember I had told you guys about 58661 in my previous video, the one that I did right before this one. And I was telling you guys about how we used to bill 58670 for elective sterilizations per ACOG, but now we can bill 58661 
whenever um, the entire tubes are removed for the sterilization. And in my op note, I'm gonna to read to you what it says here. And it says the tubes are removed in its entirety and specimens removed easily and sent to pathology. So that is what we are looking for when trying to figure out if we're billing 58661 for sterilizations. The fact that the note says that the entire tube was removed, um, I can bill 58661. Now, because this description doesn't say um, unilateral or bilateral, you can bill it twice depending on the pair. Now on your exam, um, you're not going to have to worry about payers. The only payer that you might be questioned on or you will be questioned on is Medicare, but like Blue Cross and Cigna and Highmark and Aetna, all those you're not gonna to have to worry about. And the diagnosis code that I'm reporting is Z30.2. And let me make sure there was no resident involved because if there was, I would have to change the service provider to the resident and add modifier GC. Okay, so I have three more outpatient surgeries to review. It looks like I have another LEAP procedure and my diagnoses. My CPT code is 57522. And I'm just gonna read over this op note. Okay, and because this was done two days ago, I'm gonna be waiting on pathology for this one as well. Yesterday was a holiday, so the results should be in by Monday. And now I just have two more. And this one, my next one is for an incomplete abortion. And the pre-op diagnosis code they used and post-op they used was missed abortion. But there actually is a code for blighted ovum that is the 002.0. So maybe I'll use that one. Or maybe I'll just use what they have. <laughs> um, either one is probably fine to use, but I'll just go with what the provider had for post-op diagnosis. The patient was taken to the OR. Okay, so for this one, we have treatment of a missed abortion, 59820, since this would have been her first trimester. And link my diagnosis code. And make sure there's no resident, and there's not. So this one is good to go. And there was an ENM. I'm getting an error that 99214 was billed either on the same day or the day before this major procedure, which major procedures are 90 days. And if you're billing an ENM the day before or the day of, you need to have modifier 57 on there. So I'm pretty sure the patient was probably seen in the office the day before, and then they scheduled for this DNC the next day. So we'll have to, or I'll have to go back and add modifier 57 to that e &M. Because normally if you have a 90 day surgery, um, the e &M the day before and the day of are included in the surgery. So that is why we have to go back and add modifier 57 because that is not included when you have the pre-op exam. Um, and basically that's when the decision was made to perform the surgery. So those are billable separately. I just have to find when we did it. Oh, right here. Yep. And then all I have to do is correct the charge and add modifier 57. And after I do that, my error on my charge should clear and it's gone. 
So my last outpatient surgery is a hysteroscopy and endometrial ablation. And again, that's the 58563. Um, my diagnosis is N92.0. And let me see here. Okay, and again, since this was done recently, pathology is not back for this either. So I'm gonna do the same thing. Coat it and then hold it. Alrighty, so let me show you guys what I just filled for that missed abortion and then um, the hysteroscopy in Navashore. So for the missed abortion, we did 59820 treatment of missed abortion, completed surgically first trimester. I have notes here for no symptoms, so the patient wasn't bleeding. It was confirmed to be a missed abortion by ultrasound. If she was bleeding, then it would be a treatment of an incomplete abortion because the patient had already started having the miscarriage. Um, and my diagnosis code was the post-op 002.1 missed abortion. And then for the hysteroscopy is right back over here. Again, the 58563. And then for the diagnosis code, we reported N92.0 until pathology gets back. Okay, so now all my outpatient stuff, outpatient surgeries, um, what else? Like triage, labor hall, office stuff, all that stuff is done. I started my day with like 140 charges in my work queue and now I'm down to 89. So 140 minus 89, I did 51 so far today and it's going on 11 o'clock. I'll be done at 145 because I started so early. I started at 515 and um, now all I have is inpatient stuff. their dog actually I lied oh my goodness I have so much outpatient stuff at the hospital but I doubt it it's even labor hall stuff I think it's outpatient surgeries so those will be like my hysterectomies um what else probably all hysterectomies Oh no, I have another abortion one that was done at the hospital. Uh, vaginal hysterectomy. What else? What's this one? Oh, this is a triage note. Wow, my provider actually dropped coder for this one. Um, I'm impressed and it's a freaking triage note, right? Wow. Oh my gosh, I cannot believe it. So with the triage notes, for some reason, um, our system does not prompt the provider to drop a charge. And maybe they fixed it. Oh my gosh. Well, she's usually pretty good with dropping her charges. Stop. If I have another freaking triage note, I'm going to be so happy that it's actually working. So that's two so far. Let me see. OMG, I think it's actually working. Yay! I'm getting so many triage notes. Normally, we would have to find these at the time of the delivery. And when we have all the patients like visits pulled up, we can see when she was in labor hall. 
and we would have to bill for these, but it's working. Uh, or I think it's working because before triage notes did not allow them to drop a charge. They would have to like go out and then go a whole different way to enter their charge for triage notes. But now I guess they're being prompted. <laughs> Stop it. All of them are dropping charges. Get out. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I think they solved the problem. Wow. I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm so excited, right, to have more work. <laughs> but no, because it used to be so annoying when you're trying to do the delivery and then you have to go back. And sometimes a patient will have like five times she was in labor hall and you have to click in each one and look and then see who did it and then you have to go over to her charges on her account and then type in the date and see if there was something billed if there wasn't nothing billed then you have to enter a charge and then you have to review the charge and then you have to code the charge and then you have to go back and check the other one so then the second one you do the same old thing over and over and over again until you get through all her visits and sometimes they don't bill anything but now i swear i think it's working i think it's working and I feel like it just started working this week on, or maybe last weekend, because I'm getting so many in my work queue now, and I never have this many outpatient charges to review. So, yay. Okay, so it is 11 o'clock. I'm going to take lunch now, 11 to 11.30. I only get 30 minutes of lunch, and I am going to edit this video so hopefully i can have it up today sometime today i'm going to start editing it for about a half an hour and then i'm going to come back and i should only have two hours left yeah two hours and 15 minutes left of work and that is when i'm going to tackle these deliveries and i'll just go over those quickly like i have been with the other procedures where i read them myself and then i'll do a few and then i'll show you guys what i did so i'm taking lunch Okay, you guys, I'm back from my lunch break. I went upstairs to edit and lounge with my hubby for 30 minutes. He's watching a show. Um, I like my sweater upstairs, so hopefully I'm not gonna be cold down here. The heat is on, but I should be fine. We have two hours to go, two hours and 15 minutes. Um, where I left off was we were getting ready to get into some deliveries. Um, I have one outpatient surgery that I'm going to review. Let me see what he did. This was a suction and DNC. Patient admitted to the hospital. History of early intrauterine pregnancy, ultrasound revealed, non-viable fetus, consistent with a missed abortion. She was eight weeks, so that's in the first trimester. My post-op is 0021. My CPT code will be 59820. And reading through my op note, and there is no resident, so we're good to fill this out. Okay, and the same thing happened. So 99214 was billed probably the day before, so I'll have to go to her account and add modifier what? Modifier 57. <laughs> Reviewed operative report. Oh, look, and they have modifier 25 on it. So what we're going to do is we're going to leave modifier 25 on there because there were ultrasounds done on the same day. And remember I said in my op note, ultrasound revealed um, a non-viable fetus or infant. I forget what it said. Um, so those ultrasounds were done the same day that the patient had this ENM. So modifier 25 is correct. However, we also have to put modifier 57 on there because of the surgery we did the next day that has a 90 day global. So you can report modifier 25 and modifier 57 on the same ENM. 
that is correct coding. And I will put add, added modifier 57 for surgery next day. Okay, so my first patient I have as an inpatient, she was here for delivery and it looks like we already billed for her delivery. One of my providers, for some reason, her, her charges always hold up um, a few days and we already billed out her delivery. So all I have to do is just submit no charges for these inpatient visits because they will be included in her delivery. Okay, so I have a delivery. I see there is a labor hall visit by my midwife and she attested the residents a note. And because midwives are not teaching physicians, they cannot use residents documentation and bill for it. So unfortunately, I will not be able to bill for this. So remember when I said when we bill for the deliveries, we can see all the patient's visits throughout her pregnancy. That is where I just saw that labor hall visit, and that is where I would bill for it if it was not already billed for. But since we can't bill it, I'm just moving on to the delivery for this patient. And the reason why I have to enter in no charges for these visits is because how our system is set up, um, Every single note, my provider, doesn't matter if it's a doctor, midwife, um, at the hospital, they have to have a charge with their note. And that is just so we are not missing any revenue. So there is a report that we are supposed to run as coders. It is called the missing charge report. It's the ERP report, inpatient reconciliation report. We have to run that and look for missing charges. So to eliminate these charges from showing up on that report, we put in the no charge now. So that should, you know, make sense. And you guys should think, oh, okay, I get it now. But yeah, so everything H&P progress note, we submit a dummy no charge for to satisfy that report. Um, so these notes don't show up on there as like, hey, your provider documented something, why isn't there a charge with it? So, yeah. Um, now I'm moving on to the delivery. And uh, she's 41 weeks. We have a compound presentation, meaning the baby's hand was like up at the head when she was coming out or he was coming out. Uh, we have eccentric placental cord and there were no lacerations and I'm just going to skim through her little paragraph here okay so patient came in for post date time of delivery she was 41 weeks and then it was a single live birth and then I think I had one more oh yeah that is centric cord. I use O43193 for that. My coworker doesn't use that code for that. I don't think she codes it at all, but I, I put the O43 in for that. So it just depends on if you choose to code it or not. But I usually put it on there. Um, and now I have to go and look at the patient's prenatal visits and make sure she had the same insurance throughout her entire pregnancy and make sure my office did not bill E&Ms for her prenatal visits since this is a commercial payer. When it's commercial and the insurance allows you to bill global, you do not bill E&Ms for prenatal visits. Um, and I see one here that I'll probably have to flip. 
to the 0502 F code. And when was this effective? Okay, so Blue Cross was effective on 7 1. So we have two visits with Blue Cross. No, we have two visits with Cigna. Oh, poop. We have Cigna expires or terms 829. So why did we bill any of them here? Let me see and make sure there were no infections going on. And I don't see any. So let me check her appointment to see why she was in. Um, yeah, routine OB. So this e &M I have to change to the 0502F which is a um, global, what is it called? It's like a category two or is it category three? I always get them mixed up. It is a category two code and it is a subsequent prenatal care visit. So that's what we report when we bill global and I'll show you guys that. Um, I guess I'll just keep it there so I have to flip back. So changing our ENM to 0502F, changed for routine OB. And now I have to figure out this girl's insurance because she got her own insurance September, I mean, no, July 1st. So that means this visit I can add her insurance and since she is the subscriber she had another insurance it looked like it was her she was on her dad's insurance but since she has her own insurance now she is going to be primary I mean her own insurance is going to be primary and her dad's insurance is going to be secondary so I had to flip those And it looks like everything else is good and falling in line. So we are good to bill global now. And billing global for this vaginal delivery is gonna be the 59400. And I have my diagnosis codes all ready to go. The post dates, the compound, and then the malformation of the placenta. Weeks of gestation and the single live birth, which is the outcome of delivery. Vaginal delivery report reviewed. Okay, and then the next day, do we have a subsequent? Um, we have a progress note, but I don't see that my provider dropped a charge for it. Hang on. It's been for the 19th she not drop a charge she didn't so I'm just going to add it with my other providers post op and she probably saw the patient after she delivered yep she's breastfeeding so this would have been post op day zero so instead of using the 99024 on that one I'm going to use a different no charge since it wasn't a post op day um, it was the day that she delivered. So 99024 will go on the next day. And then this one will be a regular no charge for seen by another provider. And then for post-stop days, I use Z39.2. Um, and then on the discharge summary, I look for diagnosis codes on there. And it looks like we're just going to use the post dates. Okay. Alrighty, so let me show you guys everything I just coded. 
Okay, so the first thing I did was I changed my provider's 99212 that was built in the office to the subsequent prenatal care visit, the 0502F, because we built global. And what I built for the delivery is 59400. That is the vaginal delivery, and it includes antepartum care, which are the prenatal visits. It includes the delivery itself, and then the postpartum care. So after the patient delivered, those two days she was, no, the one day she was in the hospital after she delivered. And then when she comes back for her six week check, that will be included in this 59400 code as well. Now, if patients don't come back for their six week check, we do not go back and change the charges because that's included in this service. So that's kind of like on, on the patient if she doesn't go back and um, get that visit. But practices are not going back and changing their billing from global billing to vaginal delivery only and then changing um, and then billing for the antepartum care separate. They're not doing any of that. You bill global. If the patient shows up, perfect. It's included. If she doesn't show up and she misses it, there's nothing we really do about that. Um, when it came to my diagnosis codes, I used 048.0, which is the post term. Um, I also reported for the eccentric cord insertion. I used the 043.193. And for the compound presentation, I used 036. I mean, 032.6 with XX0. And then the outcome of delivery was Z37.0 and the weeks of gestation was Z3A41. So that's all I did for that delivery. It seems like a lot, but they go pretty quickly, especially when you already know the codes by heart. I just did another vaginal delivery that was built global. And this time this patient had chronic hypertension. So I'm going to be billing the 01092 because this one's going to be for childbirth. And then she also had a second degree laceration. So right here I have a tab for lacerations and nuchal cords. So if I go over there, my laceration is right here. 070.1 for second degree. She was 38 weeks, so I have my weeks of gestation and the outcome of delivery, which was a single life born, Z37.0. And this one is ready to be billed out. I also included post-op care. So, um, oh, I guess I can share this information. So the chronic hypertension ended up turning into, what was it, like um, superimposed preeclampsia. So we have to look at pre-existing hypertension, that is the chronic hypertension. And because it turned into preeclampsia, you have to report 011, and I used five since it was after she delivered during the puerperium. And then you also need to code an 010 code. So you see that highlighted in pink, use additional code 010 to identify the type of hypertension. So 011.5 is going to be first, and then 01093 is going to be second for um, the post-op care. Now, 99024 is not or does not have a fee attached to it, but I'm reporting these codes because that's what the documentation stated. It's not going to go out to the payer um, as a claim because you don't get reimbursed for 99024. But I did want to share those diagnosis codes in case you guys ever see that where chronic hypertension turns into preeclampsia. I reviewed another vaginal delivery, um, but this time, even though it was a commercial payer, I could not bill global. And the reason being was because the patient had came to Pennsylvania from Alabama at 28 weeks. So she would have received prenatal care from her provider in Alabama and they will bill out their visits 
probably using the same code we had to bill, which was four to six visits. If they had seven or more, then they couldn't go with the 59426, but they would have to bill for the antepartum care they provided, and we have to bill for the amount of visits we billed. You cannot bill global because you did not provide the entire antepartum care. It was split up. So I had to submit a charge for 59425, and then for the delivery, I had to bill vaginal delivery, and include postpartum care. So 59410, my diagnosis for that delivery was meconium stain, which is right here, meconium in amniotic fluid, and that's 077.0. I had my weeks of gestation and the outcome of delivery. For this antepartum visit, all I used was um, a normal pregnancy because she didn't have any complications. I reported the Z3483, I believe. Yes, and she was 36 weeks. So that is what I reported on the antepartum care. And was there one more thing that I had to review? I don't think so. Oh, yes. Um, the patient had a male infant and they did a circumcision on him. My provider did. So I had to also bill... 54150 with diagnosis Z41.2 um, because this wasn't an MA plan or MA payer I did not have to include the Z38 as the primary diagnosis but yeah and that 54150 would go on the baby's account not the mother's account so you want to make sure that you are paying attention to where you're billing for this 54150 because you could receive or you will receive a denial if you try and bill it for the mother and this is a male service. Okay, you guys, that is it for this video. If you've made it to the end, make sure you are subscribed. Thank you all for watching and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye.